The ascendancy of cloud and SaaS has shown new light on how organizations think about, pay for, and value hardware. Once sought after skills for practitioners with expertise in hardware troubleshooting, configuring ports, tuning storage arrays, and maximizing server utilization has been superseded by demand for cloud architects, DevOps pros, developers with expertise in microservices, container application development and the like. Even a company like Dell, the largest hardware company in enterprise tech touts that it has more software engineers than those working in hardware. It begs the question, is hardware going the way of COBOL? Well, not likely. Software has to run on something, but the labor needed to deploy, troubleshoot, and manage hardware infrastructure is shifting. At the same time, we've seen the value flow also shifting in hardware. Once a world dominated by x86 processors, value is flowing to alternatives like NVIDIA and ARM-based designs. Moreover, other componentry like NICs, accelerators, and storage controllers are becoming more advanced, integrated, and increasingly important. The question is, does it matter? And if so, why does it matter and to whom? What does it mean to customers, workloads, OEMs, and the broader society? Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we've organized a special power panel of industry analysts and experts to address the, the question, does hardware still matter? Allow me to introduce the panel. Bob O'Donnell is president and chief analyst at Technalysis Research. Zias Caravalla is the founder and principal analyst at ZK Research. David Nicholson is, C is a CTO and tech expert. Keith Townsend is CEO and founder of CTO Advisor. And Mark Stamer is the chief, chief Dragon Slayer at Dragon Slayer Consulting and oftentimes a Wikibon contributor. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for spending some time here. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for having us. Okay, before we get into it, I just want to bring up some data from ETR. This is a survey that ETR does every quarter. It's a survey of about 1,200 to 1,500 CIOs and IT buyers. And it's, this is, I'm showing a subset of the taxonomy here, this X, Y axis. And the vertical axis is something called net score. That's a measure of spending momentum. It's essentially the percentage of customers that are spending more on a particular area then those spending less. You subtract the lesses from the mores and you get a net score. Anything, the horizontal axis is, is pervasion in the data set. Sometimes they call it market share. It's not like IDC market share. It's just the percentage of, of activity in the data set as a percentage of the total. That red 40% line, anything over that is considered highly elevated. And for the past I don't know, eight to 12 quarters, the big four have been AI and machine learning, containers, RPA, and cloud, and cloud of course is very impressive because not only is it elevated in the vertical axis, but you know, it's, it's very highly pervasive on the horizontal. So what I've done is highlighted in red that historical hardware sector, uh, the, the server, the storage, the networking, and even PCs despite the work from home are depressed in relative terms and of course data center co-location services. Okay, so you see obviously hardware is not, people aren't, don't have the spending momentum today that they used to, they've got other priorities, uh, et cetera. But I want to start and go kind of around the horn with, with each of you. What is the number one trend that each of you sees in hardware and why does it matter? Bob O'Donnell, can you please start us off? Sure, Dave. So look, I mean, hardware is incredibly important. And, and one comment first I'll make on that slide is, Let's not forget that hardware, even though it may not be growing, the amount of money spent on hardware continues to be very, very high. It's just a little bit more stable. That It's not as subject to big jumps as we see certainly in other software areas. But look, the important thing that's happening in hardware is the diversification of the types of chip architectures we're seeing and how and where they're being deployed, right? You, you refer to this in your opening. Uh, we, we've moved from a world of x86 CPUs from Intel and AMD <clears throat> to things like obviously GPUs, DPUs. We've got VPUs for uh, you know computer vision processing. We've got AI dedicated accelerators. We've got all kinds of other network acceleration tools and AI powered tools. Um, there's an incredible diversification of these chip architectures and that's been happening for a while, but now we're seeing them more widely deployed. 
And it's being done that way because workloads are evolving. The kinds of workloads that we're seeing in these some of these software areas require different types of compute engines than traditionally we've had. The other thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, the power requirements based on where geographically that compute happens is also evolving. This whole notion of the edge, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more detail later, is driven by the fact that where the compute actually sits closer to, in theory, uh, the edge and where edge devices are, depending on your definition, changes the power requirements. It changes the kind of connectivity that connects the applications to uh, those edge devices and those, edge, and those applications. So all of those things are being impacted by this growing diversity in chip architectures. And that's a very long-term trend that I think we're going to continue to see play out through this decade and well into the 2030s as well. Excellent, great, great points. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Zias, up, up next, please. Yeah, I, and I think the other thing to, when you look at this chart to remember too, is uh, you know through the, the pandemic and the work from home period, a lot of companies did put their uh, office modernization projects on hold. And you, you, you heard that echoed you know, from really all the, the, the network manufacturers anyways, that they were, um, the companies had projects underway to upgrade networks, they put them on hold. Now that people are starting to come back to the office, they're looking at that now. So we might see some change there, but Bob's right, the size of that, uh, those markets are quite a bit different. I, I think the, the other big trend here is the hardware companies, um, at least in the areas that I look at in networking are, are understanding now that it's a combination of hardware and software and silicon that works together that creates that optimum type of performance and experience, right? So some things are best done in silicon, some like data forwarding and things like that. Historically, when you look at the way network devices were built, you did everything in hardware. You configured it in hardware, you all the, did all the data forwarding, it did all the management, and that's been decoupled now. So more and more of the control element has been placed in software a lot of the high performance things, encryption, and uh, as I mentioned, data forwarding, packet, you know, packet analysis, stuff like that, is still done in hardware, uh, but not everything is done in hardware. And so it's a combination of the two. I think for the people that work with the equipment as well, uh, there's been more shift to understanding how to work with software. Uh, and uh, this is a mistake I think the industry made for a while as we had everybody convinced they had to become a programmer. It's really more a software power user. Can you? Can you pull things out of software can you, through API calls and things like that? But I think the big trend here, David, it's a combination of hardware and software working together that really make a difference. And um, you know how much you invest in hardware versus software kind of depends on the performance requirements you have. And I'll talk about that a bit later, but that's, that's, that's really the big shift that's happened here. It's that the vendors have figured out how to optimize performance by leveraging the best of all of those. Excellent, you guys both brought up some really good yeah. themes that we can we can tap into. Uh, Dave Nicholson, please. Yeah, so just uh, kind of picking up where, uh, where Bob started off, um, not only are we seeing the rise of a, a variety of CPU designs, uh, but I think increasingly the connectivity that's involved from a hardware perspective, from a, from a kind of a server or service design perspective has become increasingly important. Um, I think we'll get a chance to look at this uh, in uh, in more depth a little bit later, but um, but when you look at what happens on the motherboard, um, you know we're, we're not in a, we're not in so much a CPU centric world anymore. Uh, various application environments have various demands, and you can meet them by using a variety of components. And it's extremely significant uh, when you start looking down at the component level. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's really important that you optimize around those components. So I guess my my summary would be, um, I think we're moving out of the CPU centric hardware model into more of a connectivity centric model. We can talk more about that later. Yeah, great, and and thank you, David. And, and Keith Townsend, I'm really interested in your perspectives on this. I mean, for years you worked in a you know data center surrounded by hardware. Now that we have the software defined data center, please chime in here. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to dig deeper into that software defined data center nature of what's happening with hardware. Hardware is meeting software. Infrastructure as code is a thing. Uh, what does that code look like? We're still trying to figure out, but servicing up these capabilities that 
uh, the previous analysts have brought up. How do I ensure that I can get the level of services needed for the applications that I need, whether they are legacy, traditional data center workloads, AI, ML workloads, workloads at the edge? How do I codify that and consume that as a service? And hardware vendors are figuring this out. HPE, the big push into GreenLake and as a service, Dale now with Apex taking what we need, these bare bone components, moving it forward with DDR5, 5, 6, CXL, et cetera, and making and, and surfacing that as code or as services. This is a very tough problem as we transition from consuming it hardware-based configuration to this infrastructure as code uh, paradigm shift. Yeah, programmable infrastructure really attacking that sort of labor discussion that we were having earlier. Okay, last but not least, Mark Stamer, please. Thanks, Dave. My peers raised really good points. I agree with most of them, but I'm going to disagree with the title of this session, which is, does hardware matter? It absolutely matters. You can't run software on the air. You can't run it in, a, in an ephemeral cloud, although there's the technical cloud, and that's a different issue. The cloud has kind of changed everything from a market perspective. In the 40 plus years I've been in this business, I've seen this, this perception that hardware has to go down in price every year. And part of that was driven by Moore's law. And we're coming to, let's say a lag or an end, depending on who you talk to, to Moore's law. So we're not doubling our transistors every 18 to 24 months in a, in a chip. And as a result of that, there's been a higher emphasis on software. From a market perception, there's no penalty. They don't put the same pressure on software from the market to reduce the cost every year that they do in hardware, which kind of is bass backwards when you think about it. Hardware costs are, are fixed. Software costs tend to be very low. It's kind of a weird thing that we do in the market. And what's changing is we're now starting to treat hardware like software from an OPEX versus CAPEX perspective. So yes, hardware matters, and we'll talk about that more in length. You know, I want to follow up on that, and, and I wonder if, if, if you guys have a, have a thought on this. My, Bob O'Donnell, you and I have talked about this a little bit. Mark, you just pointed out that Moore's Law is sort of waning. Pat Gelsinger recently at their investor uh, meeting yeah. said that he promised that Moore's Law is alive and well. And, and the point I made in one of breaking analysis was, okay, great, you know, Pat's at doubling transistors every 18 to 24 months, let's say that Intel can do that, even though we know it's waning somewhat. Look at the M1 Ultra from Apple. They, they in, in about 15 months, increased transistor density on their package by 6X. So to your earlier point, Bob, we have this sort of these alternative processors that are really changing things. And to Dave Nicholson's point, there's a whole lot of supporting components as well. Do you have a comment on that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point, Dave. And <clears throat> one thing to bear in mind as well, not only are we seeing a diversity of these different chip architectures and different types of components as, as a number of us have, have raised, the other big point, and, and I, think it, uh, uh, I think it was Keith that mentioned it, CXL and interconnect on the chip itself is dramatically changing it. And a lot of the more interesting advances that are going to continue to drive Moore's law forward uh, in terms of the way we think about performance, if perhaps not number of transistors per se, is the interconnects that become available. You're seeing the development of, of chiplets or tiles, people use different names, but the idea is you can have different components being put together eventually in sort of a Lego block style. And what that's also going to allow, not only is that going to give interesting performance possibilities because of the faster interconnect, so you can share, uh, have shared memory between things, which for big workloads like AI, huge data sets can make a huge difference in terms of how you talk to memory over a network connection, for example. But not only that, you're going to see more diversity in the types of solutions that can be built. So we're going to see even more choices in hardware from a silicon perspective because you'll be able to piece together different elements. And oh, by the way, the other benefit of that is we've reached a point in chip architectures where not everything benefits from being smaller. We've been so focused and so obsessed with when come it come, comes to Moore's law to the size of each individual transistor. And yes, 
For certain architecture types, CPUs and GPUs in particular, that's absolutely true. But we've already hit the point where things like uh, RF for 5G and Wi-Fi and other wireless technologies and a whole bunch of other things actually don't get any better with a smaller transistor size, they actually get worse. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of these chiplet architectures is you can actually combine different uh, chip manufacturing sizes. You know, you hear about four nanometer and five nanometer along with 14 nanometer on a single chip, each one optimized for its specific application yet together they can give you the best of all worlds. And so that's, we're just at the very beginning of that era, which I think is gonna drive a ton of innovation. Again, gets back to my comment about different types of devices located geographically different places at the edge in the data center, uh, you know, in a private uh, cloud uh, versus a public cloud. All of those things are gonna be impacted and there'll be a lot more options because of this silicon diversity and this interconnect diversity that we're just starting to see. Yeah, Dave, David Nicholson's got a, got a graphic on that that we're going to show later. later. Before we do that, I want to introduce some data. <clears throat> I actually want to ask Keith to comment on this uh, before we you know, go on. Uh, um, this, is, uh, this next slide is some data from ETR that shows the percent of customers that cited difficulty procuring hardware. And you can see the red is, the, they had significant issues and it's most pronounced in laptops and networking hardware on the far right hand side, but virtually all categories, firewalls, peripherals, servers, storage are having either moderately difficult uh, uh, procurement issues, that's the sort of pinkish or significant challenges. So, so Keith, I mean, what are you seeing with your customers in, in the hardware supply chains and bottlenecks? And you know, we're seeing it with automobiles and appliances, but it, so it goes beyond IT, the, semi, the semiconductor you know, challenges. You know, what's been the impact on the buyer community and, and society? And, and do you have any sense as to when it will subside? You know, I was just asked this question yesterday and I'm feeling the pain. Uh, the, you know, people question why did, uh, kind of a side project within the CTO by that we built the hybrid infrastructure, a traditional IT data center that we're walking with the traditional customer and modernizing that data center. So it was, you know, kind of a snapshot of time of 2016, 2017, 10 gigabit Arista switches, some uh, older Dell 730 XD switches, you know, speeds and feeds. And we said we would modernize that with the latest Intel stack and connect it to the public cloud. And then the pandemic hit and we are experiencing a lot of the same challenges. I thought we easily migrate from 10 gig networking to 25 gig networking path that customers are going on. The 10 gig network switches that I bought used are now double the price because you can't get legacy 10 gig network switches because all of the manufacturers are focusing on the more profitable 25 gig for capacity. Even the 25 gig switches, and we're focused on networking right now, is hard to procure. We're talking about nine to 12 months or more lead time. So we're seeing customers adjust by adopting cloud. But if you remember early on pandemic, Microsoft Azure uh, kind of gated customers that didn't have uh, a capacity agreement. So customers are keeping an eye on that. There's a desire to abstract away from the underlying vendor to be able to control or provision your IT services in a way that we do with VMware vSphere or some other virtualization mm -hmm. technology where it doesn't matter who can get me the hardware, they can just get me the hardware because it's critically impacting uh, projects and timelines. So that's a great setup Zias for you. With Keith mentioned the, earlier the software defined data center with with software defined networking and cloud, do you see a day where networking hardware is commoditized and it's all about the software or <laughs> are we there already? Uh, no, we're, we're not there already. And, and I don't see that really happening anytime in the near future. I do think it's changed though. And, and just to be clear, I mean, when you look at that data, this is saying customers have had problems procuring the equipment, right? And there's not a network vendor out there I've talked to Norman Rice at Extreme. I've talked to the, the folks at Cisco and Arista about this. They all said they could have had blowout quarters had they had the inventory to ship. So it's not like customers aren't buying this anymore, right? Uh, I do think though, when it comes to uh, networking, network is 
uh, certainly changed some because there's a lot more control, as I mentioned before, that you can do in software. Um, and I think customers need to start thinking about the types of hardware they buy and, you know, where they're going to use it and how it's, you know, what its purpose is. Because if I've talked to customers that have tried to run software and commodity hardware and where the performance requirements are very high and it's, it's bogged down, right? It's, it just doesn't have the horsepower to run it. And uh, I've, I've even, you know, even when you do that, you have to start thinking of the components you use, the NICs you buy. And I've talked to customers that have simply just gone through the process of replacing a NIC card in a commodity box and had some performance problems and, you know, things like that. So if, if agility is more important than performance, then by all means, try running software on commodity hardware. I think you, that works in some cases. If performance though is more important, that's when you need that kind of turnkey hardware system. And I've actually seen more and more customers reverting back to that model. In fact, when you talk to even some startups that think today about it, when they come to market, they're delivering things more on appliances because that's what customers want. And so there's this kind of app pivot, this pendulum of agility and performance. And if performance absolutely matters, that's when you do need to buy these kind of turnkey, turnkey pre-built hardware systems. If agility matters more, that's when you can go more to software, but the underlying hardware still does matter. So I think, you know, will we ever have a day where you can just run it on whatever hardware? You know, maybe, but I'll long be retired by that point. So I don't care. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, you, know, it's, you, bring, you bring up a good point, Zias. And I remember the early days of cloud, the narrative was, oh, the cloud vendors, they, you know, they don't use EMC storage. They just run on commodity storage. And then of course, lo and yeah. behold, you know, they trot out James, Ham James Hamilton to talk about all the custom hardware that they were building and you saw Google well, the, and Microsoft. The industry's been calling for this forever, right? And I mean, all the way back to the turn of the century, we were calling for the commodity hardware. And it's it's never really happened because you can still drive, a, as, as long as you can drive innovation into it, you know, and you'll, customers will always lean towards the innovation cycles because they get more features faster and things. And so the vendors have done a good job of, of keeping that cycle up and it's, it's uh, because it'll be a long time before. Yeah, and that's and that's why you see companies like Pure Storage. Your yeah. storage company yes. has sixty-nine percent gross margins. All right, I want to go jump ahead. Uh, we're going to bring up the slide four. I want to go back to something that that Bob O'Donnell was talking about: the sort of supporting act. You know, the diversity of of, of of silicon, and we've marched to the cadence of Moore's law for decades. You know, we asked them, you know, is Moore's law dead? You know, we say it's moderating. It, Dave. Dave Nicholson, you want to talk about that, those supporting components, uh, and you shared with us a slide that shift, you call it a shift from a processor centric world to a connect centric world. What do you mean by that? And, and let's bring up slide four and you can talk to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so first I, I, I want to echo this sentiment that, you know, the, the question does hardware matter is sort of, the answer is like, of course it matters. Um, maybe the real question should be, should you care about it? <laughs> and the answer to that is, it depends who you are. If you're if you're an end user using an application on your uh, on your mobile device, maybe you don't care how the architecture is put together. You just care that the service is delivered. <clears throat> but as you back away from that and you get closer and closer to the source, someone needs to care about the hardware, and it should matter. Why? Because essentially, what hardware is doing is it's consuming electricity and dollars. And the more efficiently you can configure hardware the more bang you're, get, you're going to get for your buck. So it's not only a quantitative question in terms of how much can you deliver, but it also ends up being a, a qualitative change as capabilities allow for things we couldn't do before because we just didn't have the aggregate horsepower to do it. So, so this, is, uh, this chart actually comes out of some performance tests that were done. Um, uh, so it happens to be uh, uh, Dell servers with Broadcom components. And the point here was to peel back, um, you know, peel off the top of the server and look at what's in that server, starting with, uh, you know, the PCI interconnect. So PCIe Gen 3, Gen 4, moving forward. What are the effects on, from an interconnect perspective on performance, application performance translating into new orders per minute processed per dollar, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the advances in CPU architecture mapped against uh, the advances in interconnect and storage subsystem performance, 
you can see that there that that um, that CPU architecture is sort of lagging behind in a way. And Bob mentioned this idea of tiling and all of the different ways to get around that. Um, when when we do performance testing, we can actually peg CPUs just running the performance tests without any actual database environments working. So right now we, we're at this sort of imbalance point where you have to make sure you design things properly to get the most bang per kilowatt hour of power per dollar input. So the key thing here, uh, what this is highlighting is just as a, as a very specific example, you take a card that's, that's designed as a gen three PCIe device and you plug it into a gen four slot. Now the card is the bottleneck. You plug a gen four card into a gen four slot. Now the gen four slot is the bottleneck. So we're constantly chasing these bottlenecks Someone has to be focused on that from an architectural perspective. It's critically important. So there's no question that it matters, the, uh, but of course, various people in this food chain won't care where it comes from. I guess a, a good analogy might be, where does our food come from? If I get a steak, it's a pink thing wrapped in plastic, right? Well, there are a lot of inputs that a lot of people have to care about to get that to me. Do I care about all of those things? No. Are they important? They're critically important. So, okay, so all, I want to get to the, okay, so what does this all mean to, to customers? And so what I'm hearing from you is this, the, to balance a system, it's, it's becoming you know, more complicated. And I kind of been waiting for this day for a long time because as we all know, the, the bottleneck was always the spinning disk, the last mechanical. So, so people who wrote software knew that when they were doing a write, the disk had to go and do stuff. And so they were doing other things in the software. And now with all these new interconnects and flash and things like you could do atomic writes. And so that opens up new software possibilities um, and combine that with alternative processes. But what's the so what on this to, to the customer and, and the application impact? Did anybody address that? Yeah, let me address that for a moment. I want to leverage some of the things that Bob said, Keith said, Zoo said, and David said. Yeah. So I'm a bit of a contrarian in some of this. For example, on the chip side, as the chips get smaller, 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer, five nanometer, soon three nanometer, we talk about more cores, but the biggest problem on the chip is the interconnect in the chip because the wires get smaller. People don't realize in 2004, the latency on those wires in the chip was 80 picoseconds. Today, it's 1300 picoseconds. That's on the chip. This is why they're not getting faster. So we may be getting a little bit slowing down in Moore's law, but even as we kind of conquer that, you still have the interconnect problem. And the interconnect problem goes beyond the chip. It goes within the system, composable architectures. It goes to the point where Keith made Ultimately, you need a hybrid because what we're seeing, what I'm seeing and I'm talking to customers, the biggest issue they have is moving data, whether it be in a chip, in a system, in a data center, between data centers. Moving data is now the biggest gating item in performance. So if you want to move it from, let's say, your transactional database to your machine learning, it's the bottleneck. It's moving the data. And so when you look at it from a, uh, a distributed environment, now you've got to move the compute to the data. The only way to get around these bottlenecks today is, is to spend less time in trying to move the data and more time in taking the compute, the software running on hardware, closer to the data. So, so go ahead. So, so is this what you mean when, when Nicholson was talking about a, a shift from a, a processor-centric world to a connectivity-centric world? You're talking about moving the bits across all the different components, um, not having the processor you're saying is essentially becoming the bottleneck or the memory, I guess. Well, that's one of them. And there's a lot of different bottlenecks, but it's the data movement itself. It's moving away from, okay, why do we need to move the data? Can we move the, the, the compute, the processing closer to the data? Because if we keep them separate, and this, is, this has been a trend now, where people were moving the processing away from it. It's like the edge. I think it was Zeus or David, you were talking about the edge earlier. As you look at the edge, who defines the edge, right? Is the edge a closet or is it a sensor? If it's a sensor, how do you do AI at the edge? 
when you don't have enough power, you don't have enough compute. Well, people are inventing chips to do that, to do all that at the edge, to do AI within the sensor, instead of moving the data to a, a data center or a cloud to do the processing. Because of the lag and latency, is always limited by speed of light. How fast can you move the electrons? And all this interconnection, all the processing and all the, the improvement we're seeing in the PCIe bus from three to four to five to CXL to uh, higher bandwidth on the network, and that's all great, but none of that deals with speed of light latency. And that's yeah, an issue. Know, Go ahead. You know, you know, Mark, no, no, I just want to just, because what you're what you're referring to can be looked at at a macro level, which I think is what you're describing. You can also look at it at a more micro level from a systems design perspective. Right. Uh, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the the resident uh, knuckle dragging hardware guy uh, in the in, on the panel today. But but it's exactly right. You, moving compute closer to data includes concepts like peripheral cards that have built-in intelligence. Right. So uh, again, in in some of this testing that I'm referring to we saw dramatic improvements when you basically took the, the horsepower, instead of using the CPU horsepower for things like IO, uh, now you have essentially offload engines in the form of uh, storage controllers, RAID controllers, mm -hmm. of course for ethernet, uh, NICs, smart NICs. Um, and so when you can have these sort of offload engines and we've gone through these, these waves over time, you know, people, people think, well, wait a minute, RAID controller and NVMe, uh, you know, flash storage devices, does that make sense? Um, it turns out it does. Why? Because you're actually at a micro level doing exactly what you're referring to. You're bringing compute closer to the data. Now, closer to the data, meaning closer to the data storage subsystem, it doesn't solve the macro issue that you're referring to. Um, but it is important, again, going back to this idea of system design, optimization, always chasing the bottleneck, plugging the holes. Someone needs to do that in this value chain in order to get the best value for every kilowatt hour of power and every dollar. Yeah, well, this whole drive, this whole drive for performance has created some really interesting architectural designs, right? Like you, like Nicholson, like uh, I, you know, one of the, you know, the, the rise of the DPU, right? Brings more processing power yep. into systems that already had a lot of processing power. There's, all, there's also been some really interesting, um, you know, kind of uh, innovation in the area of systems architecture too. If you look at the way NVIDIA goes to market, their their drive kit is a pre-built piece of hardware, you know, optimized for self-driving cars, right? They partnered with Pure Storage and uh, Arista to build that AI-ready infrastructure. And I, I remember when I talked to Charlie Giancarlo, the CEO of Pure about when they rolled, the three companies rolled that out, he said, look, if you're going to do AI, you need good storage, you need fast storage, fast processor and fast network. And so for customers to be able to put that together themselves was very, very difficult. There's a lot of software that needs tuning as well. So the three companies partnered together to create a fully integrated turnkey hardware system with a bunch of optimized software that runs on it. And so in that case, in some ways the hardware was leading the software innovation. And well, you so you know, the, 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 the variety of different architectures we have today around hardware is, is really exploded. And I think part of that's what, you know, Bob brought up at the beginning about the different chip design. Yeah, Bob yeah. talked about that earlier, Bob. Yeah. I mean, most yeah. it, most AI today is modeling. You know, a lot of that's yeah. done in the cloud. And, and it, it looks, from my standpoint anyway, that the future is going to be a lot of AI inferencing at the edge. And that's a radically different architecture, Bob, isn't it? It is, it's a completely different architecture. And, and just to follow up on a couple of points, excellent conversation, guys. Uh, Dave talked about system architecture and really this, that's what this boils down to, right? But it's looking at architecture at every level. I was talking about the, the individual different components, the new interconnect methods. There's this new thing called UCIE, um, universal uh, connection. I forget what it stands for, um, but it's a mechanism for doing chiplet architectures. But then you, again, you have to take it up to the system level because it's all fine and good if you have this SOC that's tuned and optimized but it has to talk to the rest of the system. And that's where you see other issues. And you've seen things like CXL and other interconnect standards. You know, and nobody likes to talk about interconnect because it's really wonky and really technical and, and not that sexy. But at the end of the day, it's incredibly important. Exactly to the other points that were being raised, like Mark raised, for example, about getting that compute um, closer to where the data is. And that's where, again, a diversity of chip architectures help. And exactly to your last comment there, Dave, um, 
putting that ability in an edge device is really at the cutting edge of what we're seeing on a semiconductor design. And the ability to, for example, maybe it's an FPGA, maybe it's a dedicated AI chip. It's another kind of chip architecture that's being created to do that inferencing on the edge. Because again, it, that the cost and the challenges of moving lots of data, whether it be from say a smartphone to a cloud-based application, or whether it be from a private network to a cloud or any other kinds of permutations we can think of really matters. And the other thing is we're tackling bigger problems. So architecturally, not even just architecturally within a system, but when we think about DPUs and, and the, the sort of the East-West uh, data center movement conversation that we hear NVIDIA and others talk about, uh, it's about combining multiple sets of these systems to function together more efficiently, again, with even bigger sets of data. So it really is about tackling where the processing is needed, having the interconnect and the ability to get where the data you need to the right place at the right time. And because those needs are diversifying, we're just going to continue to see an explosion of different choices and options, which is going to make hardware even more essential, I would argue, than it is today. And so I think what we're going to see, not only does hardware matter, it's going to matter even more in the future than it does now. Great, yeah, great discussion, guys. I, I want to bring Keith back into the conversation here. Keith. If your main expertise in tech is provisioning LUNs, you probably <laughs> want to look for another job. So maybe clearly hard, you know, hard, hardware matters, but with software defined everything, do people with hardware expertise matter outside of, for instance, component manufacturers or cloud companies? I mean, VMware certainly changed the dynamic in servers. Dell just spun off its most profitable asset in VMware. So it obviously thinks hardware can stand alone uh, how does an enterprise architect view the shift to software defined hyperscale cloud? And how do you see the shifting demand for, for skills in enterprise IT? So I love the question and I'll take a different view of it. If you're a data analyst and your primary value add is that you do ETL transformation. Uh, talked to a CDO, a chief data officer of a mid-sized bank a little bit ago. He said 80% of his, uh, his data scientist time is done on ETL. Super not value add. He wants his data scientist to do data science work. If you're long, if chances are, if your only value is that you do long provisioning, then you probably don't have a job now. The, the technologies have gone, gotten much more intelligent as infrastructure pros, we want to give infrastructure pros the, the opportunities to shine. And I think the software defined nature and the automation that we're seeing vendors undertake, whether it's Dell, HPE, Lenovo, take your uh, pick, the pure storage uh, NetApp that are doing the automation and the ML needed so that uh, these practitioners don't spend 80% of their time doing long provisioning and focusing on their true expertise, which is ensuring that data is stored, data is retrievable, data is protected, et cetera. I think the shift is to focus on that part of the job that you're ensuring no matter where the data is at, because as my data is spread across the enterprise, hybrid, different types, you, you know, Dave, you talk about the super cloud a lot. If, 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 it's, if my data is in the super cloud, Protecting that data and securing that data becomes much more complicated when it was than when it was me just procuring or provisioning loans. So when you say where should the shift be or look be, is you know focusing on the real value, which is uh, making sure that customers can access data, can recover data, can uh, get data at performance levels that they need within the price point they need to get that those data sets and where they need. And we talked a lot about where they need out. One, one last point about this interconnect thing. I have this vision and we all, I think we all do of, of composable infrastructure. This idea that scaled out does not solve every problem. If I, uh, the cloud can give me infinite scale out. Sometimes I just need a single OS with 64 terabytes of RAM and 204 GPUs or uh, GPU instances. That single OS does not exist today. And the opportunity is to create composable infrastructure so that we can solve a lot of these problems that just simply don't scale out. 
You know, wow, so many interesting points there. I had just interviewed uh, Jamak Dagani, who's the founder of Data Mesh last week, and she made a really interesting point. She said, think, think about, we have separate stacks. We have an application stack and we have a data you know, pipeline stack. And the transaction systems, the transaction database, we extract data from that. We, to your point, we ETL it in, you know, it takes forever. And then we have this separate sort of data stack. If we're going to inject more intelligence and data and AI into applications, those two stacks, her contention is they have to come together. And when you think about, you know, super cloud, bringing, bringing compute to data, that was what Hadoop, Hadoop was supposed to be. It ended up all sort of going into a central location. But does that, it's, it's almost a rhetorical question. I mean, it seems that that necessitates new thinking around hardware architectures that kind of everything's the edge. And the other point is, to your point, Keith, it's really hard to secure that. So when you think about offloads, right? You know, you've heard the stats, you know, Nvidia talks about it, Broadcom talks about it, that, you know, 30%, 25 to 30% of the, the CPU cycles are wasted on doing things like storage offloads or networking or security. It seems like maybe ZS, you have a comment on this. It seems like new architectures need to come together to support, you know, all of that stuff that Keith and I just spewed. Yeah, and by the way, I do want to, uh, he, the question is to ask Keith, it's the point I made at the beginning too about uh, engineers do need to be more, more software centric, right? Uh, uh, they do need to have better software skills. In fact, I remember talking to Cisco about this last year where when they surveyed their engineer base, only about a third of them had ever made an API call, which, you know, that, that kind of shows the, this big skill set change, um, you know, that has to come. But on the, on the point of architectures, I, I think the big change here is, is edge in, because it brings in distributed compute models. Historically, when you think about compute, um, even with multi-cloud, we never really had multi-cloud. We use multiple centralized clouds, but compute was always centralized, right? It was in a branch office, in a data center, in a cloud. With edge, what, what, what we creates is the rise of distributed computing where we'll have an application that actually accesses different resources and at different edge locations. And I think Mark, you were talking about this, like the edge could be our IOT device, it could be your campus edge, it could be cellular edge, it could be your car, right? And so we need to start thinking about how our applications interact with all those different uh, parts of that edge ecosystem, you know, to create a single experience. The consumer apps, a lot of consumer apps largely works that way. If you think of like an app like Uber, Right, it's it's it pulls in information from all kinds of different edge location edge services, and you know it creates a pretty cool experience. We're just starting to get to that point in the business world now. Um, there's a lot of security implications and things like that, but I do think it drives more architectural decisions to be made about how I deploy what data where and where I do my processing, where I do my AI and things like that. And it's it actually makes the world um, more complicated in some ways. We can do so much more with it but I think it does drive us more towards turnkey systems, at least initially in order to, you know, ensure performance and security. Right, Mark, I wanted to go to you. You had, you had uh, indicated to me that, that you wanted to chat about this a little bit. You've written quite a bit about the integration of hardware and software. You know, we, we've watched Oracle's move from, you know, buying Sun and then basically using that in a highly differentiated approach, you know, engineered systems. You know, what's your take on all that? I know you also have some thoughts on the shift from CapEx to, to OpEx, chime in on that. Sure, when you look at it, there are advantages to having one vendor who has the software and hardware that can synergistically make them work together that you can't do in a commodity basis. If you own the software and somebody else has the hardware, I'll give you an example, would be Oracle, as you talked about with their Exadata platform. They literally are leveraging uh, microcode in the Intel chips and in now in AMD chips and all the way down to uh, Optane. They make basically AMD database servers work with Optane memory, PMEM, in their storage systems, not NVMe, uh, SSD PMEM. I'm talking about the cards itself. So there, there are advantages you, you can take advantage of if you own the stack, as you were putting out earlier, Dave, uh, both the software and the hardware. Okay, that's great. But on the other side of that, that tends to give you better performance, but it tends to cost a little more. On the commodity side, it costs less, but you get less performance. What Zeus had said earlier, it depends where you're running 
your application. How much performance do you need? What kind of performance do you need? One of the things about moving to the edge, and I'll get to the OpEx, CapEx in a second, one of the issues about moving to the edge is what kind of processing do you need? If you're running in a CCTV camera on top of a, of a traffic light, how much power do you have? How much cooling do you have um, that you can run this? And more importantly, do you have to take the data you're getting and move it somewhere else to get processed and the information is sent back? I mean, there are companies out there like BrainChip that have developed AI chips that can run on the sensor without a CPU, without any additional memory. So, I mean, there is innovation going on to deal with this question of data movement. There's um, companies out there like Tachyon that are combining GPUs, CPUs, and TPUs in a single chip. Think of it as super composable architecture. Yeah, they're, they're looking at, uh, at being able to do more in less. On the OPEX and CAPEX issue- Hey, hold that thought. Hold that yeah. thought on the OPEX CAPEX because we're running out of time yeah. and maybe you can wrap yeah. on that. I just wanted to pick up on something you said about the integrated hardware and software. I, I mean, other than the fact that, you know, Michael Dell unlocked, uh, whatever, $40 billion for himself and, and Silver Lake, I was always a fan of, of a spin in with VMware, basically become the Oracle of, of hardware. Now I know it would have been a nightmare for the ecosystem and culturally they probably would have had a VMware brain drain, but, but does anybody have any thoughts on that as a sort of a thought exercise? I was always a, a fan of that on paper. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 like I, I got to eat a little crow. I, I did not like the VM, the Dale VMware acquisition for the industry in general. And I think the, it hurt the industry in, in general, HPE, Cisco uh, walked away a little bit from that VMware relationship. Uh, but when I talked to customers, they loved it. I, I got to be, you know, I got to be honest. They, they absolutely loved the integration. The VxRail, VxRack solution exploded. You know, Nutanix became kind of an afterthought uh, when it came to competing. So that spin in, when, you, when we talk about the ability to innovate and the ability to uh, create solutions that you just simply can't create because you don't have the full stack. Uh, Dell was well positioned to do that with a potential span in of VMware. Yeah, we're going to be. Uh, Actually, uh, I, go I, ahead, please. I want to. Well, yeah, Bob. In fact, um, I think you're right, Keith. It was terrible for the industry, great for Dell. And <laughs> I remember talking to Chad Sackett when he was running, uh, you know, VCE, which became Rack and Rail. Uh, their ability to stay in lockstep with what VMware was doing. What was the number one workload running on hyperconverged forever was, was VMware. So their ability to remain in lockstep with VMware gave them a huge competitive advantage. And Dell came out of nowhere in the, you know, the hyperconverged market and just started taking share because of that relationship. So, you know, this sort of, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, from a Dell perspective, I thought it gave them a pretty big advantage that they didn't really exploit across their other properties, right? And networking and servers and things like that they could have given the dominance that VMware had. From an industry perspective though, I do think it's better to have them decoupled, but yeah. um, so. I agree, I mean, they could have, I think they could have <laughs> dominated in the super cloud and maybe they could, yeah. they would become the next Oracle where everybody hates them, but they kick ass. But um, we guys, we, <laughs> we, we, we got to wrap up here. Yeah. And so what I'm going to ask you is, is and I'm going to go in reverse order this time, but you know, big takeaways from this conversation today, which guys, by the way, I can't thank you enough. Phenomenal insights, uh, but big takeaways, any final thoughts, any research that you're working on that you want to, you want to highlight, highlight uh, uh, or, you know, what you look for in the future. Uh, tr try to keep it brief. Uh, we'll go in reverse order. Maybe Mark, you could start us off, please. Sure, on the research front, I'm working on a total cost of ownership of an integrated database analytics machine learning versus separate services. Uh, on the other aspect that I wanted to chat about real quickly, OpEx versus CapEx, the cloud changed the market perception of hardware in the sense that you can use hardware or buy hardware like you do software as you use it, pay for what you use in arrears. The, the good thing about that is uh, you're only paying for what you, what you use, period. You're not paying for what you don't use. Compute time, everything else. The bad side about that is you have no predictability in your bill. It's elastic, but every user I've talked to says, every month it's different. And from a budgeting perspective, it's very hard to set up your budget year to year, and it's causing a lot of nightmares. So it's just something to be aware of. 
from a capex perspective, you have no more capex if you're using that kind of perspective, uh, that kind of base system. But you lose uh, a certain amount of control as well. So ultimately, that's some of the issues. But my biggest point, my biggest takeaway from this is the biggest issue right now that everybody I talk to in some shape or form, it comes down to data movement, whether it be ETLs that you talked about, Keith, or other aspects, moving it between hybrid locations, moving it within a system, moving it within a chip. All those are key issues. Great, thank you. Okay, CTO advisor, give us your final thoughts. All right, really, really great commentary. Again, I'm going to point back to us taking the walk that our customers are taking, which is trying to do this conversion of, of all primary data center to a hybrid of which I have this, this hard earned philosophy that enterprise IT is additive. We rarely, when, they, when we add a service, we rarely subtract a service. So the landscape and surface area, what we support has to grow. So we're, our research focuses on taking that walk. We're taking a monolithic application, decomposing that to containers and putting that in a public cloud and connecting that back to the private data center and telling that story and walking that walk with our customers. Uh, this has uh, been a super enlightening panel. Yeah, thank you. Real, real different world coming. Uh, David Nicholson, please. Uh, you know, it really harkens back to um, the beginning of the conversation. You talked about momentum in the direction of cloud. Uh, I'm sort of uh, spending my time under the hood, getting uh, grease under my fingernails, uh, focusing on where still the lion's share of spend will be in coming years, which is on-prem. And then of course, obviously uh, data center infrastructure for cloud, but really diving under the covers and helping folks understand the ramifications of movement between generations of CPU architecture. I know we all know uh, Sapphire Rapids pushed into the future. When's the next Intel release coming? Who knows? We think, you know, in 2023, there've been a lot of people standing by uh, from a practitioner standpoint asking, well, what do I do between now and then? Does it make sense to upgrade uh, bits and pieces of hardware or go, go to go from a, a last generation to a current generation when we know the next generation is coming. And so I've been very, very focused on looking at how these connectivity components like RAID controllers and NICs, I know it's not, it's not as sexy as talking about cloud, but, um, but, but just how these components completely change the game uh, and actually can justify movement from say a 14th generation architecture to a 15th generation architecture today, even though gen 16 is coming, let's say 12 months from now. So, so, th so, so that's where I am, uh, you know, keep my, keep my phone number in the Rolodex. I literally reference Rolodex intentionally because like I said, I'm in there under the hood and it's not as sexy, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so, so that's what I'm focused on, Dave. Well, you know, to, to paraphrase, a maybe der derivative paraphrase of you know, Larry Ellison's rant on what, what is cloud, it's operating systems and databases, et cetera. RAID controllers and NICs live inside of clouds. All right, you know, one of the reasons I love working with you guys is because you have such a wide observation space and, and Zias Caravalla, you, you of all people, you, know, you're, you have your fingers in a lot of pies. So give us your final thoughts. Yeah. I'm not as propeller heady as my chip counterparts here. So uh, you know, I, uh, I, I look at the world a, a little differently. And a lot of my research I'm doing now is the impact that distributed computing has on customer and employee experiences, right? There's a, you look at talk to every business and how they, the experiences they deliver to their customers is really differentiating how they go to market. And so they're looking at these different ways of feeding up data and analytics and things like that in different places. And that this is going to have a, I think this is going to have a really profound impact on enterprise IT architecture. We're putting more data, more compute in more places, uh, all the way down to like little micro edges and retailers and things like that. And so we need the, the variety, like historically, if you think back to when I was in IT, you know, you know, pre Y2K, we didn't have a lot of choice in things, right? We had a server that was rack mounted or stand up, right? And, um, uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, differences in, in choice, but today we can deploy, you know, these really high performance compute systems on little blades inside servers or inside, you know, the autonomous vehicles and things. And I, I, I think the world from here gets, you know, just the choice of what we have and the way hardware and software works together is, 
is, is really going to, I think, change the world the way we do things. We're already seeing it, like I said, in the consumer world, right? There's so many things you can do from, you know, smart home perspective, you know, natural language processing, stuff like that. And it's starting to hit businesses now. So just wait and watch the next five years. Yeah, totally. The, hey, the, hey. the computing yeah. power at the edge is just going to be mind blowing. It's, it's unbelievable what you can do at yeah. the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey Z, I, I just want to, I just want to say that we know you're not a propeller head and, and, and I, for one, would like to thank you for having your master's thesis uh, hanging on the wall behind you because uh, we know that you studied basket weaving uh, <laughs> at, at university. Ooh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was actually a physics math major, so. <laughs> Good man, another math major. All right, Bob O'Donnell, you're going to bring us home. I mean, we've seen the importance of, of semiconductors and silica in, in our everyday lives, but uh, your last thoughts, please. Sure, and, and just to clarify, by the way, I'm a, I was a great books major, and this was actually for my final paper. <laughs> so I was like philosophy and, and, and all that kind of stuff and literature. Um, but I still somehow got into tech. Um, look, it, it's been a great conversation. And, and I want to pick up a little bit on a comment Zia's made, which is this, it's the combination of the hardware and the software and coming together and the manner with which that needs to happen, I think is critically important. And, and the other thing is because of the diversity of the chip architectures and all those different pieces and elements, it's going to be how software tools evolve to adapt to that new world. So I look at things like what Intel is trying to do with one API, you know, what NVIDIA has done with CUDA, uh, what other platform uh, companies are trying to create uh, tools that allow them to leverage the hardware, but also embrace uh, the variety of hardware that is there. Um, and so as those software development environments and software development tools evolve to take advantage of these new capabilities, that's going to open up a lot of interesting opportunities uh, that can leverage all these new chip architectures, that can leverage all these new interconnects, that can leverage all these new system architectures. And figuring out ways to make that all happen, I think, is going to be critically important. And then finally, I'll mention the research I'm actually currently working on is on private 5G and how companies are thinking about deploying private 5G and the potential for edge applications for that. So I'm doing a survey of, of several hundred US companies as we speak, and, and we're looking forward to getting that done in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, look forward to that. Guys, again, thank you so much. Outstanding conversation. Any, anybody going to be at Dell Tech World in a, a couple of weeks? Bob's going to be there, Dave Nicholson. Well, uh, drinks yep. on me, and uh, guys, really, can't thank you enough for the insights and your participation today. Really appreciate it. Okay, and thank you for watching this special power panel episode of theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Remember, we publish each week on siliconangle.com and wikibon.com. All these episodes, they're available as podcasts. DM me or any of these guys, I'm at dvellante. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com. Check out etr.ai for all the data. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.